what that book's about. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Amachi and Japanese Americans in Colorado. But first, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to uh, like minimize that. All right. So, so first, I want to talk about the Asians before the Japanese, Japanese Americans. Uh, there was actually a Filipino settlement in Louisiana back in the 1760s, and there are still descendants of those Filipinos in the swamps of Louisiana, uh, outside of New Orleans, and uh, most people don't know about that. That's the problem with our history, is that most people don't know about the Asians. Even in Denver, they don't know that there was a Chinatown in lower downtown Denver, or that uh, there, there was, was a stretch, stretch of Larimer that, that was all Japanese and Japanese American owned businesses for decades. And people don't remember that stuff. So the Chinese were the first wave of immigrants, um, a large wave of immigrants uh, from Asia to come to the US. They came for gold, right? The gold rush. And they called the United States or America, they called America Gold Mountain. And they settled around the San Francisco area, but then they faced all this uh, this racism, and they weren't allowed to own mines, and they were chased out of the mines where they were working uh, for white owners. But they got a reputation as being hardworking, dependable, cheap labor, and easy to stereotype, unfortunately. And when you look at this history of immigrants coming to America with the American dream who ended up becoming you know, hardworking, dependable, cheap labor, that is the history of America and the waves of immigrants that continues to this day. And that's, I think, part of the reason why Asians are, are still uh, facing um, you know, difficulties. But look at all the other immigrant communities. Look at the Muslims after 9-11. Look at uh, Latinos uh, today, Latinx community. Uh, from uh, the southern border and what's happening there. Uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act was signed in 1882. Well, it lasted until 1953. This is kind of a typical image of the Chinese in uh, American mass media newspapers uh, at the time. And, uh, you know, it was the yellow peril or the yellow terror, uh, as this caption calls them. Uh, and this is a pretty famous picture when the Continental Railroad, Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1869 and uh, 10, over 10,000 Chinese laborers helped build the Transcontinental Railroad from the West Coast to this place here, Promontory Point, Utah, where the railroads from both ends of the country met. And there was this big celebration and this is a very famous picture and if you Google it and then blow up the picture, you will see not a single Asian face. Chinese laborers were not allowed to attend this celebration at all. So a friend of ours, um, a Chinese American photographer named Corky Lee for years, uh, he, he died last year, unfortunately of COVID, but he, for years he assembled descendants of these Chinese laborers as well as um, you know, people from the Asian American community to pose with the same uh, pose and, you know, doing the toast and everything uh, between these two uh, locomotives at Promontory Point, Utah. And he called it photographic justice. So I mentioned that there was a Chinatown in lower downtown Denver. This is all that's left of it today. It's a plaque that says Hop Alley Chinese Riot of 1880. Bunch of things that are problematic with this plaque. It's on a building that faces uh, Caddy Corner, faces Coors Field on 20th and Market, or 20th and Blake. And Hop Alley was a, a derisive description of the Chinese as drug addicts. And calling it a Chinese riot of 1880 is way wrong because it was on October 31st, 1880, when whites rioted and destroyed and burned down Chinatown. And, um, and killed a man, uh, uh, Look Young, and a young Look, Look Young, and um, beat him to death and hung him from a lamppost at 19th and Arapaho. Not far from here, you know, this is, 
this is uh, the history that our country has to uh, unfortunately face. And uh, just last weekend, as it happens, uh, Mayor Michael Hancock gave a formal apology to the descendants of uh, their two families that live in Denver today who are descendants of people who lived and worked in Chinatown. And so he gave a formal apology to Chinese, the Chinese community, the Asian American community. He cited Japanese American incarceration during World War II, and he signed this official apology from the city of Denver. Uh, we are the fifth city outside, or fifth city in the United States to receive an official apology from a city, and the first outside of California, and the first that doesn't have like a 30%. Asian population. We have less than 4% Asian population. So pretty big deal that the city of Denver apologize. Uh, this is a picture of that Chinese riot, quote unquote Chinese riot from 1880. And um, you know, this, this is used a lot. This, this story about the apology got picked up by everybody from the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times to uh, MSNBC and CBS News. So it was a big story. Now, I mentioned that the Chinese Exclusion Act was signed in 1882. It banned most Chinese from coming to the United States because people said that they were taking jobs and for less money and stealing jobs from white workers and, um, and that they were drug addicts and they were this, they were that. And so in 1882, using that riot from 1880 as an excuse, the US Congress passed, and then it was signed into law, the Chinese Exclusion Act, the, still the only legislation that bans uh, a certain nationality uh, from coming to the US. And it was uh, rescinded finally, uh, like a century later, but uh, it took a long time. And by 1885, the Farmers and businesses in the Western part of the US realized, oh no, we still need workers. <laughs> so uh, they actually reached out and started to invite Japanese immigrants. And Japan was opened up to the West by uh, Commodore Matthew C. Perry and the US Navy that just, you know, uh, uh, took their ships into Tokyo Harbor and said, you're gonna open up after 300 years of the samurai era where they did not allow foreigners uh, at all really to, uh, to engage uh, with Japan. There were some Portuguese and Dutch who were allowed to trade with Japan from at the Southern end. But um, so once the Japanese were invited to come in 1885, they were hardworking, dependable, cheap labor. And they were still easy to stereotype as the other. So here's an example. Um, you know, there are a lot of things when Japan was opened up. Culture, the Japanese culture was really fascinating to the West. So if you like impressionist paintings, Van Gogh, Monet, Manet, Gauguin, Renoir, all those guys and a couple of women, Mary Cassatt, were fascinated by Japanese art. And the Japanese art made it to the West because these woodblock prints were used as wrapping paper to, <laughs> to send stuff from Japan to Europe and the United States. And these painters saw this stuff and thought, wow. And they started copying the colors and the perspective and the, the flatness of the colors and um, the images. And, uh, and so culture became an important thing. Food, Japanese food it was very exotic and not, not a lot of different kinds of things made it, but it was fascinating. And then Gilbert and Sullivan, these uh, two playwrights in England, uh, wrote this really racist play called, uh, or operetta, I guess, uh, called The Mikado, and uh, debuted in 1885, and it takes place in Japan in a town called Titipu, which is totally fake. And the characters have stupid names like Nankipu and Yum Yum, the actors were all white with fake kimonos and bad makeup. And this other picture down here that says May 3rd and 4th, that was May 3rd and 4th of 2014 when the University of Denver brought a Gilbert and Sullivan troupe to perform at the Newman Center, uh, the Mikado. And um, 
I attended, it was disgusting. It was all, you know, the same. Uh, white actors in yellow face uh, with really, really awful accents playing supposedly Japanese characters. The one thing that was really special about the Japanese when they started to come to the US is that unlike the Chinese immigrants who were mostly men, except for the women who were who became prostitutes, uh, that, that was just something that, that was brought over to keep peace or whatever it was, but um, the Japanese were invited to, to bring wives. So the thinking was that if the Japanese laborers got married, then they would settle down and be very reliable and so on and so forth. And so the uh, practice of mail order brides, uh, picture brides was started where guys in the US would send a picture to their home village in Japan, but it would be a picture of them like from 20 years earlier, or it would be like some young guy that they work with and say, hey, give me your picture. And, and they would send the picture and trick women to come into uh, the US to marry them. The, the side effect, if you wanna call it that of this, was that they had families. And uh, unfortunately for the people who thought they had figured out how to control these Asians is that in the United States constitution, if you're born in the United States, you are an American citizen. So that started the Nisei or second generation of Americans who are from, uh, of Japanese heritage. And uh, although the immigrants couldn't own property, couldn't, you know, couldn't do a lot of things, uh, they couldn't vote, they weren't allowed full citizenship rights, their children could. So all of a sudden, these Japanese immigrants started buying farms, starting businesses and putting loans and whatever their property in their children's name. What happened is that uh, by World War II, um, the hatred of the Japanese was almost as intense as the hatred of the Chinese had been. And they faced a lot of racism. And when Pearl Harbor was bombed, and I'm skipping this big like 40 year history here, and Marge, you can <laughs> fill in some of it. Um, almost 100, and, well, more than 110,000 people of Japanese ancestry were sent to 10 uh, concentration camps. That's what the US government called them uh, throughout the Western United States, two in Arkansas, one in Colorado called Amachi in Southeast Colorado. And, uh, and when I've seen older Japanese Americans get together, invariably the conversation would include the, pick, the, the, the question, which camp were you at? And they weren't talking about summer camps. They were talking about which one of these uh, incarceration camps were they held in? Or in the case of this picture on the upper right, uh, the uh, temporary camps where they were put while the quote unquote permanent camps were being built. And most of the temporary camps were in um, like horse uh, racing tracks and families were just left to sleep on top of hay, on top of horse manure in stables. Um, but these are typical pictures. And I think Marge, I think I saw that you, you use one of these pictures, oh. right? These are pictures, I didn't know this, but this picture of the, the family around the stove, that's one room in a camp. And the picture was taken by Dorothea Lang. And so was the picture of the woman in the middle. Dorothea Lang was a famous photographer uh, for Life Magazine in the 1930s and 40s and 50s. And uh, she was hired by the US government to, to take pictures of uh, the Japanese American incarcerees. And she actually identified with them and thought it was horrible. And she took a bunch of really powerful images. Um, this is a camp called Amachi in Southeast Colorado. It's like 16 miles or just a few miles west of the town of Lamar. And it's right outside the town of Grenada which Japanese Americans all call Granada. And um, Amachi was the kind of the nickname given to the camp and it's named after uh, a, uh, uh, 
indigenous Native American princess who was married to John Prowers, who was a white man who was powerful in that part of the state. Um, Prowers County is named after him. This is a picture of Amachi from overhead. And then uh, you have, you know, tried to make life as normal as possible. You got baseball teams and a, and a newspaper. Every one of these camps had newspapers. And you can actually see digital copies of the newspapers that have been archived in uh, at a company called, or a site called dencho.org, D-E-N-S-H-O. And uh, uh, it's based in Seattle, started by a, a guy who took a buyout from Microsoft and started this amazing project to chronicle the history of Japanese American incarceration. And this is a funeral that happened uh, during the war. You can see the guard tower in the back and uh, that style of guard tower has been recreated uh, by students and volunteers uh, in the years, in recent years. So um, the, the camp closed in 1945 and what's left is, you know, here's an example of the uh, newspaper What's left is a tiny plot of grass with a fence around it that students from the school in Grenada built to uh, a chain link fence to keep out the animals that were trampling over all the grass and eating the grass in this little plot, which was a cemetery. And there's just a handful of these little markers left. Uh, and this is you know, clearly somebody who uh, born and died on the same day. Uh, it's very sad, but this is where the cemetery is, is where the annual pilgrimage uh, to Amachi is, uh, starts. When you drive down to Amachi, uh, that's where you'll first go. Uh, there were Japanese in Colorado who were not locked up because all the people who were locked up in incarceration camps uh, we're from the West Coast. This is a picture, uh, a still from a Rocky Mountain PBS uh, documentary on co the Colorado experience about the Brighton Buddhist Temple, which was a, a Buddhist temple built by its congregants. And then about, I think like eight or nine years ago, uh, it had been empty for a while, unused. And uh, a developer bought it and turned it into a, a pizza restaurant and a brew pub. And apparently it's got great pizza. So I, I do wanna go sometime. The restaurant did it right. They respected the origin of the building. They have pictures of the temple back when it was used as a temple. They have pictures of the people who attended uh, the temple. And they actually got one of the ministers from the Tri-State Denver Buddhist Temple here in Denver at Sakura Square to go up to Brighton and, and give a ceremony uh, for the opening of the of this restaurant, so uh, I actually want to go there because they they respected the history. Uh, here's a picture from a 1920 funeral in Pueblo, where the minister from the Tri-State Denver Buddhist Temple drove down and gave a uh, a, uh, a a ceremony uh, for a funeral, and then there were lots of Japanese Americans uh, in northern Colorado and in southern Colorado, like uh, the San Luis Valley, uh, who are farmers. And this is a tweet that somebody sent me who remembered seeing uh, train loads of sheep offloading uh, at Buckeye, Colorado, uh, because they belonged to the Matsuda family and they were big, big sheep farmers. Bob Sakata, the guy in the, in the book cover in the middle, at one point he was the largest exporter of produce to Japan from Colorado. And uh, his, his family, his son, he's retired now, but his son runs the uh, farm. Sakata Farms is re really well known. And in the Longmont area, there, there are a bunch of, of uh, uh, Japanese American owned farms, Maeda Farms, is just one of them, happens to be my, uh, my son-in-law's family's uh, farm. Uh, not, no, no longer active, but you know. Uh, and here's a couple of pictures from pre-war to post-war. 
the pre-war pictures from the, a newspaper called the Colorado Times on Larimer. And you know everybody's dressed up in their Japanese finery. On the right is a picture of my wife's family, um, my wife's great grandmother's family really uh, after the war. And uh, they lived in like the Five Point City Park area and they attended Manual High School. Here's a, a series of pictures of businesses that were on Larimer. There's a stretch of Larimer from like 19th all the way to 35th that had dozens of Japanese and Japanese American owned businesses from hotels to hairdressers uh, to you know dry cleaners, photographers, and this is the mochi making uh, factory. Uh, there's also a soy sauce making factory. If you know the restaurant called Hop Alley, and it's an Asian American owner who understands the origins of the Hop Alley word, the phrase, and, and how it can be racist. He likes to talk to people about the history of that term and uh, where he's at. His building is actually where the soy sauce factory used to be. <laughs> so he, uh, he felt like he was meant to be there. Uh, so uh, he's, it's a popular restaurant. Fred's Pool Hall here later became Akebono. That's the taller of the two buildings here. And it's, this building was right across Larimer Street from where Sakura Square is today, between 19th and 20th on Larimer. And then the Sky Cafe was uh, also on Larimer. And it's a you know diner that served Japanese food and American food. Fred's Pool Hall started as a pool hall and they served, it was a pool hall with American diner food, Chinese food and Japanese food. Then they changed the name to Akebono. And then in 1973, a year after Sakura Square was built, the family moved the restaurant Akebono across the street to Sakura Square. 20th Street Cafe sadly closed about a year and a half ago, uh, was an institution in Denver on 20th Street right off of uh, Lawrence. Uh, but there were other, other uh, businesses, Mikawa, Mikawaya Manju, for pastries, Min Yasui Law Office. He worked for the city of Denver for many years and left a legacy of civil rights uh, work. Shoe Repair, the Sky Restaurant. And these were all businesses run by Japanese Americans. So I mentioned Manual High School before. This is a 1952 Manual Thunderbolt yearbook. And by 1952, which is remember seven years after the end of the war, there was a Nisei student organization at the high school with just get, you know second generation Japanese Americans. This is the prom royalty for the year. I think it's prom, I hope it's not homecoming. I keep saying prom, <laughs> but African-American queen and a white and Japanese American attendant. To me, that's an amazing sign of the reality of how color were only allowed to live in certain parts of town. That's why Manual High School uh, was considered for so many years as an internet connection is unstable. <laughs> Hope that uh, keeps going. Um, but anyway. since the war as well as before the war but you know we've always had boy scout troops uh we've always had uh celebrations with traditional kimono uh that's my wife's family in the center photographs with uh, she's the young one there with her mother grandmother and great-grandmother and i love that photograph so it was taken at the tri-state denver buddhist temple and that's a street dance called obon or bon odori uh, where everybody's dancing on the street. And now they can't really close down uh, Lawrence anymore. So it's uh, held in the parking lot between um, uh, Pacific Mercantile Supermarket and the Tri-State Denver Buddhist Temple. Sakura Square 
which is the hub of the local Japanese American community, was built by the state's second licensed black architect. Uh, and it's about to be changed. Uh, it'll take a few years, but it's gonna be redeveloped. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm actually gonna be writing this long narrative about the history and importance of Sakura Square as it is today uh, for the National Archives in Washington, DC, but it needs to be redeveloped. I kind of, I agree with that. The building is not the best. And um, so uh, there's a lot of history there. It'll continue to be the hub of the Japanese and Japanese American community. If anything, it's gonna become more Japanese. So look, watch for that in the next couple of years. Every year on or around February 7th, February 19th, um, there's a day of remembrance held in, in communities across the country by Japanese American organizations. Um, and February 19, 1942 was when President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which led to the imprisonment of uh, more than 110,000 people of Japanese ancestry. This was from uh, 2018, I think, maybe 2019, uh, the speaker there sitting down, uh, her name is Satsuki Ina, and she's an activist from San Francisco, and she came and spoke at the time about stop repeating history, and it was about, she linked the Japanese American incarceration to the separation and imprisonment of Latinx families and refugees, um, you know, uh, from the, at the southern border. After this day of remembrance, actually, she led a protest down to Texas, to Crystal City, Texas, and uh, and she's been very active in in fighting this and making sure that people remember and uh, what happened to Japanese Americans. So there is an annual pilgrimage, as I mentioned, to uh, Amachi. The first camp pilgrimages began in '69 at Manzanar. Oh man, I have a typo in that. How embarrassing. I've showed this like a zillion times. It's, it says Manazanar uh, in 1969. Uh, the first Amachi pilgrimage was in 1976 and you're gonna to get to, to hear from a woman who uh, helped plan that uh, here. Uh, each year's pilgrimage is held the Saturday before Memorial Day weekend. This year, it'll be May 21st. Uh, you want to get down to Amachi by 11 a.m. when the various talks and tributes and flower laying at the memorial uh, at the camp happens, and then people will go to the school in the town of Grenada for lunch and, and speeches and things. Um, but it's going to be really special because uh, uh, earlier in March, uh, President Biden signed into law the Amachi Historical Site Act, which was a bipartisan uh, legislation drawn up by uh, Jonah Goose and uh, Ken Buck, who were uh, representatives, and Hickenlooper, uh, John Hickenlooper, and, uh, and uh, Michael Bennett, who are our state senators. And uh, it allows Amachi, once the town of Grenada deeds over the land, and it may take until next year, but once that's done, they're gonna deed the land over to the National Park Service, and Amachi will become the fifth uh, incarceration site in the country to become a national park. And that allows for more funding and, you know, park rangers and, and just uh, a much more uh, official presentation. Right now, a lot of it's, or not a lot of it, but parts of it have been refurbished or rebuilt, and it's been done through donations, uh, individual donations, and the hard work of a lot of volunteers, and a class at Grenada School. It's a school that goes from like, you know, first grade to 12th grade, and the high school students have had a class called the Amachi Preservation Society, which uh, is run by a social studies teacher who's also now the principal guy named John Hopper, and uh, uh, they've done a lot of this work, and they maintain a museum in the town of, of Grenada, and they talk all over the state and all over the region to multiple states 
about Amachi and the history of Japanese Americans. This is the uh, memorial where people first gather, gather when you get down there. And it, it lists all the, the people from Amachi who um, joined the US military to fight against the, the Nazis and, and the, you know, uh, in Italy and Germany and France, even while their families were locked up in Amachi. So try to get your head around that. This is that rebuilt guard tower. And this is a, the sign. I took this like a few years ago, so it looks better now. <laughs> it's better maintained. Um, but it's going to be a very special pilgrimage to Amachi. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. This is a picture of a rebuilt uh, barrack. Uh, you can go in and see kind of the space that families had to live in. This is a picture of. Uh, uh, the week after the Amaki pilgrimage is the annual Memorial Day service. There is a memorial to Nisei veterans or Japanese American veterans uh, at Fairmount Cemetery. And all the names of the uh, Nisei from Amachi uh, or from Colorado are etched in the front and in the back, uh, any Japanese American veteran who has fought for the United States is, is uh, etched in the back. My dad who fought in the Korean War is, uh, is etched in the back. So it's a very powerful uh, annual event. This is a picture of Joe Sakato, who was a Met, uh, uh, Medal of Honor recipient who fought in this uh, famous battle to rescue uh, 200 Texas soldiers who were trapped uh, in the woods of France, forests of France. And um, when his best friend died in his arms, he got so enraged that he ran up the hill and, and uh, killed a bunch of Nazi soldiers and, and took out a machine gun nest. And uh, he came back to Denver after the war and he worked for decades at a, as a, uh, for the US post office. And after his death, uh, the, his post office named uh, the post office location by the stockyards after Joe. I thought that was a very moving thing. These are some Japanese and Japanese American organizations. Uh, they're, they're actually, you know, when you think about it, there are quite a few. I, I'm always surprised when I look at this and, and see how much our community is represented uh, in the Denver area. So, uh, so that's it. I thank you for letting me talk. I probably talked way too long. Um, Marge, let's see if we can get your, your thing in here. You can only get 21 people. Hmm? You can only get slides 21 people. Okay. Um, but they did get loaded? Yeah, which is wrong. 